Well, good morning. Hope you are well this morning. If you have a Bible, let's grab that and open it to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, uh, verse 43 and following. Matthew 5, 43 and following. I just want to give a quick thank you for those of you who came out last weekend to the Shindig. Uh, good time had by all, allegedly. Uh, when you plan for 800, 1,000, and 3,000 or so show up, it presents challenges. But uh, it was great. Uh, we especially want to give a shout out and our prayers to JC, Rick, and RD, who are all still recovering from the Pastor Dunk Tank. Many people say, Greg, why didn't you get in the dunk tank? And the answer was obvious to anyone paying attention. And it was that it was right beside the axe throw. And I know where I stand. So <laughs> no games there. All right, so if you're just joining us, my name is Greg Pinkner. I'm the teaching pastor here at Fellowship. Uh, we are looking at the book of Matthew, and we are in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 picks up a new tack in the Sermon on the Mount. So last week, we looked at the sections of, the, of the, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus undermines your knowledge of your goodness. Uh, he undermines the knowledge of your goodness by showing you uh, what the law actually is, what the law actually does. Uh, he asks questions. Uh, you, you have heard it said, do not commit murder. And you're like, count it, I'm good. Never murdered anybody. And then he says, but if you've ever called someone a name in anger, you murdered them in your heart. And you go, Oh no, the Starbucks line was slow on my way here. So I went into a Starbucks and, and killed everybody by yelling names, right? Uh, he goes on and on and on. He presents all these things that, that most people would say, never done that, I'm, a, I'm good, I, I made it through. And then he shows what the actual law is, how much perfection Jesus and God requires on judgment day. It's not just enough to say I never murdered anybody. It's did you ever call someone a name in anger? It's not enough to say I never committed adultery. It's did you ever even look at someone lustfully? It's not enough to just say I made a promise. It's did you keep it even to your death? These kind of things. Uh, it's very undermining. The, the listener would get through the first section of the Sermon on the Mount and go, well, I'm in big trouble. Uh, the second section we're gonna look at is not much better. Uh, because this time Jesus is gonna undermine your goodness in a different way. Not by the exposure of what's wrong in you, but by eroding the confidence of what you think we've done right. All the ways that what we think we've done is right. Jesus is gonna go, actually, it's, it's much more difficult than that. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter four, uh, or excuse me, five, verse 43 and following. Uh, you have heard it uh, that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Uh, I don't think an American survives this verse over the last 10 years, right? Especially the last two years. Uh, love your enemy and pray for them, right? Uh, we're too busy owning them. I, I want you to consider that Jesus is saying, uh, this is not just a verse that offends the modern America. Uh, this verse is responsible for one of the most massive dismissals of Christianity in the history of the world. Uh, it was Nietzsche that read this verse and went, Christianity's worthless. I better figure something else out. Uh, and you can see what the thinking of Nietzsche unleashed in Western culture. The very idea that it's not enough just to love the people that love you back, which can be challenging at times. And if you think, well, it's not that challenging, I'll remind you that Thanksgiving's three weeks from now. Right? So if you're getting all boastful, being like, I love all the people who love me. Halfway through Thanksgiving, you're going, put arsenic in the turkey. <laughs> it adds the spice to it, right? Uh, but I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, you know, we, we all sit watching uh, the erosion of what we would consider biblical ethics in all sorts of life. And, uh, you know, as a pastor, I'm often asked, how do you teach a sexual ethic in today's world? And I'm like, I don't have to. I'll just teach this. 
this will be as eroding to someone's understanding of their goodness before Jesus as anything. Love your enemy, pray for those, not just who don't like you, who persecute you. The language is important. It's not just people who don't like you. Love and pray for the person who is actively trying to hurt your life. Right? Not just, hey, tolerate it, I'm fine, everything's fine. Love them and pray for the person who's trying to ruin your life. And if you think, well, you know, yeah, that's good for the Sermon on the Mount, watch this one. Uh, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. You could just say children here. Uh, any Christian who says, I'm singing, I'm a child of God in the morning, right? Uh, are you? According to this verse? I mean, we can go back to the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God, right? Same ethic. Uh, he goes further and he says this in 46 and 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Tax collectors were loathed by the Jewish people. Under the Roman tax, uh, tax arrangement, they would go into a country that they had conquered and they would get traitors to the country and they would go to people and they'd go, do you wanna betray your country? And they'd say, yes. Do you want everybody in your block to hate you? Yes, I do. Uh, and they would make them tax collectors. Tax collectors weren't Romans that showed up. They were Jews. And the rule of the Roman tax was uh, the emperor wants 6% taxes, but you can charge whatever you want and they'll have to pay it. You just have to give 6% of it to the emperor. So some guys would go, the taxes are 11% this year and some guys would go, the taxes are 70% this year and there was nothing you could do about it and you hated the IRS, right? You need to understand the charge that's being made to Jesus when they're looking at him going, you eat with tax collectors. We just kind of gloss over and go, oh yeah, everybody hates the tax people. No, 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 no. Jesus made one of the tax collectors his apostle and then sent that dude to Israel and even to write this book to Israel. I need you to feel this challenge, a challenge to your moral order. You see, it's one thing to stand up, and this is something Christians excel at, is going, I'm not as bad as they are. I don't do the evil things they do. I don't steal, I don't murder, I don't. I'm a good person. But what Jesus is gonna do now is challenge your notion of good, because you would say, I'm a loving person. This is Jesus' standard of loving. How are we doing? It's one thing to say, hey, Greg, don't go murder people. It's one of my favorite things, but I'm not gonna do it because I'm a Christian, right? But now Jesus is gonna take on the notions of what makes religious people think they're good people. I'm loving. Let's test that theory. Let's test it, okay? The true standard is to love your enemies and pray for them. You'll say, no one does that. Romans 5, that while we were enemies, while we hated God, Christ Jesus died for us and gave himself as an offering. So this is not a hypothetical. This is not Jesus just trying to stir the water. This is what he's doing. Uh, and in verse 48 uh, you're going to see the standard that Jesus will use. To me, Matthew chapter five, verse 48 is the thesis sentence of the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew 5, 48 says this, you must therefore be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Uh, because uh, of the way the Bible is often taught, what people wanna hear is that this is our hyperbole. They wanna say, Yes, Jesus said that, but what he really meant was this. Because that happens so many times in the New Testament. Jesus says things that we have to go back, okay, here's what he's actually saying to his context. 
Uh, so here's what he's actually saying to his context. It takes a little bit of nuance. He's actually saying, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's the lesson. Uh, the person who thinks I'm a very good person, Jesus and God are gonna let me into heaven because I'm a very good perfect person. The question is not, are you a good person? The question is, are you perfect? Because only perfect people get into heaven, period. It is not a gradation scale. It is an either or scale. You are either perfect or you are not. And if you are not, God cannot forgive your sin. So you need to see the challenge he's putting before these people. Uh, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the Greek literally says, and the people were amazed because they had been punched in the face. That's what the Greek says. They had received a blow. Uh, earlier, if you've been here, he says, you have to be, if your righteousness, if what God requires of you does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom. The scribes and Pharisees were the best people they'd ever heard of. The scribes and the Pharisees were the best people they'd ever heard of. Uh, he goes on and goes into religious practices. Matthew chapter six, verse one. Beware of practicing your righteousness. Righteousness is a church word that we often lose the meaning. The word righteousness just means to do the things that God requires you to do. That's all it means. Doing the things that God requires you to do. That's righteousness. Uh, so when we talk about the gospel and we say that Paul, say for example in the New Testament says, I have been found in Christ not having a righteousness of my own, but the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. What's he saying? I have come to God not on the basis that I did what God required, but on my faith in Jesus that is actually what God required of me. A little translation. Beware of practicing your righteousness. Beware of doing the things that God says you're supposed to do before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Righteousness sets the stage, but we must pay attention to the audience. He says, doing righteous things in order to be seen by others or to be seen by your Father in heaven. Every section in this passage that we're gonna look at in the Sermon on the Mount this morning ends with this phrase. And then your Father who sees what you do in secret will see you. And it's meant to give a notion of the private life. That who we are inside, who we are in secret, like we have an American phrase, right? Character is what you do when no one's watching. Right? Character is who you are when no one's watching. Uh, who you are is who you are when no one's watching. When the social pressure's gone, when the potential social reward is gone, who you are. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have, they have received their rewards. Hypocrites is gonna be a huge player here in the next few verses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their rewards. He'll go on, but when you fast, dress up, look really good. Don't go around telling everybody you're vegan or keto, right? Just don't do it. Don't talk about it. Don't do it to be seen by others. But this is interesting. He continually uses this word hypocrites. The word hypocrite was the Greek word for an actor, the Greek word, Hippocrates, is an actor. You ever seen the drama masks, the big smiley face, the big sad face? This is how they acted. They'd hold the masks up to show you what mood they're in. Jesus says they're disfiguring their faces. He's playing into this notion. And if I can't get across to you the idea that putting on a face to try to portray ourselves as a religious, righteous people is the exact opposite 
of what Jesus wants from us, then I don't know what to do. It is the impetus almost every person has when they're trying to live out the Christ life. I don't feel this. There's something else at work with me, but I'll just put on the brave face. I'll act better than I am. I'll go to church even though I don't believe it. Uh, People will ask me if I'm okay, and I'll say sure, even though I'm not. Uh, Because people who are not okay don't have their lives together, and Christians are supposed to have their lives together. Uh, If the Sermon on the Mount should teach you anything, the principal lesson should be, your life's a mess, and so is mine. There's no one who is a bigger hypocrite in this church than me. Nobody. Do you know why? Because I stand up here the most. Uh, The Bible says I'm gonna be judged doubly hard, and that's gonna be a hard day. So one of the things I try to do to get up here is tell you how terrible I am, how evil, how much sin still dwells in me because I have a hope in a Savior and not my own. They disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. He goes on to prayer. Uh, He doesn't talk about singing worship, but let's talk about it for a minute. Almost nothing in the Christian church today has become more performative than worship singing. I'll hold my hand up, I'll sing. The music will make me feel a way that I don't. I'm not bashing worship. Love worship, love a worship song. I'm saying it's become an extremely convenient way to hide. Uh, I don't wanna go too far because sometimes saying I'm going to sing this song and believe it even though I don't feel it is an act of worship. There's nuance here. Please hear me say that. Uh, But we've watched uh, contemporary worship wash over people and give them religious experiences they aren't really having because they're the hypocrite. Because I'll raise my hand, I'll sing the song and I will show myself to be what I'm not. Christianity is about an honest evaluation of the heart, and here's the thing, it's not good. It's not gonna be easy, right? The fundamental way we become a Christian is to confess our sins to God that we need saving from, and it never stops, right? It's like a house with children, It doesn't matter how many times you clean it. They're coming back with worse ideas. You think you've cleaned it. And then all of a sudden you look under your couch and you realize that's where COVID came from. (laughs) That's what happened. It was a quesadilla that got hidden under the couch for six weeks. Not that anything like that's ever happened in my house. I'm having horror, I'm having a flashback. I'm having PTSD flashback, I'm sorry. <laughs> the life in Christ is having a sin you've always dealt with that gnaws at your soul, that rages against you, that you have prayed to be released from, that you have begged God to be over, only to fall into it over and over and over again, to consistently confess it, to have what you think is a victory over it, and then for the Holy Spirit to go, Now layer two. Most of us run afraid from the spotlight that the Holy Spirit brings into our closets, not realizing that is salvation. That is the salvation. The salvation is not the hiding. The salvation is not the mass. The salvation is the Holy Spirit digging through your heart's closet and going, what is this? And you're going, I don't know, it was QVC saying it was night. I don't know what happened. Like, the confession of it is the freedom of it. Everything about Christianity is the opposite of what the world would be. It's the weakness that gives us strength. It's the confession of the sin that saves us. It's not the, I will be a good person that saves us. Jesus is taking that down. Oh, you went to church your whole life, did you? Okay, let's examine that. Oh, you went to to Passion and sang really loud? 
That's awesome. Let's talk about that. Religious performance is worthless. An honest pursuit of what God is doing in your heart is is the basis of what this really truly is. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go in your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Here's the line again. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. He continues. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do for they think that they will be heard for their many words. I love this verse. I love it for multiple reasons. Number one, it rem- I call this type of prayer the high school or college male prayer. And you're going, what does that mean? See if this sounds familiar. Jesus, God, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for Jesus, God. And we thank you for the food, Jesus, God. God, Jesus, thank you for my mom, Jesus, God. And thank you, Jesus, God, for the mom. So you're listening because you get it. And then they just start throwing out Sunday school answers because they run out of stuff. Jesus God, thank you for my mom, Jesus God. Uh, Ten Commandments, Jesus God, thank you, Jesus God. Thank you for the <laughs> Bible, Jesus God. Give, give all's win, Jesus God. And also thank you, Moses, Jesus God, and uh, King David, amen. Right? I love those guys, man. They're better than the guy who prays and goes, oh God, our Father, When did you get an English accent? (laughs) You're from Halls. Like, what are you, what are you doing? God, our Savior's coming to us today. (laughs) Do you see the performance he's picking at? They stand on the street corner so people will see them. Or they use many words. They think God's gonna listen for their many words. No. No. The Sermon on the Mount is designed to teach you the principle of worship. It's the perfection that humanity can actually pursue. Uh, Humanity's strained relationship with God starts in the Garden of Eden, right? In Genesis chapter three. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree. This is Eve talking But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave to some to her husband who was with her and he ate. What is the selling point? Oh, it's good food. No. Oh, it tastes really good. No. It'll give you a lot of knowledge. No. The selling point is you'll be like God. Sin is not at its core a violation against a written code, an arbitrary written code. Sin at its core is saying, I am God and you aren't. Or even worse, I am my own God. Every sin is fundamentally saying, I am my own God. When God gives the 10 commandments to Moses, what's commandment number one? Exodus 20, you shall have no other gods before me, which includes yourself. When Jesus is arguing with the scribes and the Pharisees about what the greatest commandments are, what does he say? Do you know? Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. Understand what Jesus just said. Everything 
about you and God is wrapped up in these two sentences. Everything, everything. Martin Luther, it is Reformation Sunday, so we'll give him a shout out in the sermon. Martin Luther said on the 10 Commandments, if you could keep the first one, you wouldn't need the other nine. If you could keep the first one, you would have never needed the other nine. Because fundamentally what sin is, is a rejection of God. What does the Sermon on the Mount deliver to you? What it hopefully does is grant you a small glimpse of the perfection of humility. Of humility. He is God and I am not. He is the perfect one, not me. I see all the ways I'm not him. The sinful nature in our souls pushes against that. But, but I'm also, I'm, stop. Just stop. And sit in a moment of realizing the perfection of humility. The Lord's Prayer follows. Uh, <laughs> it amazes me, uh, in, I mean, in, in uh, concern, it amazes me in concern how many people wanna use the Lord's Prayer as a formula after Jesus literally says, don't use a bunch of words, <laughs> right? The Sermon on the Mount is not a model for how we pray. It's a model for how we live because it's a prayer of fundamental humility. It's a prayer of fundamental humility. Like, you've heard it so many times like, you know, we chant it, you know, sometimes. I was, when I played varsity basketball in Texas before we got ready to go out there, we'd be like, all right, ready? All right, up. Like, I can't even read it now without falling into that thing we would say. And we're just ready to go, does King power go for let's go, yeah! You know, go run out. Like, that's exactly, no. On Judgment Day, Jesus is gonna show a video of me doing that like 37 times at games and going, what was that? And I'm gonna go, ah. ah. <laughs> Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy, set apart, one above all be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Jesus' kingdom being on earth as it is in heaven means that every single sin ever committed will be punished to an infinite degree. Uh, there's no gradation in if we are perfect or imperfect. There's also no gradation on punishment of sin. Well, that was a little sin. Perfection is the standard. And yet, this is better. It is better that Jesus' kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. If Jesus links the amount of forgiveness you will receive on judgment day to the amount of forgiveness you give on this earth, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others' trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. See, I say that and you go, well, that's a hypothetical. It's actually the next verse. It's the next verse. Uh, this is a hypothetical I ran through my own mind this week as I tortured myself with this passage. What if our eating was tied to our forgiving. And I don't mean just going, okay, I forgive you, it's fine. I mean, actually, truly forgiving was what it was required to eat. Could you do it? I put this in front of you, and if you leave here going, okay, I've gotta get to work. I gotta work harder. It's not done what I wanted it to do because it's not what the Bible intends for it to do. What the intention is, both of the section that says, uh, you're not guilty of murder. Have you ever called someone a liar? Have you ever called someone a name in anger? 
Uh, you're, you've never committed adultery. Have you ever looked at someone lustfully? Uh, you've, you've never broken an oath, okay. Uh, have you pursued righteousness to the extent that you've cut your hands off and gouged out your eyes? No, but that's the standard. In the same way, the standard is, uh, if you're gonna be religious, you have to be perfectly religious. Uh, he talks about giving to the needy, and he says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. That's not, it's not possible, but it is the standard. The Sermon on the Mount is meant to crush you into dust. It seems cruel and harsh, and I don't expect you to leave here particularly gospel, right? But if the law doesn't do its work in our hearts, grace will never be amazing to you. Grace is not amazing to a culture that is told, Jesus forgives your mistakes, you know, the little things you did that he needs to get over. He wanted you there the whole time, so he was like, it's fine. Consider the cost if the payment was the blood of God's son. If you go to the store and you buy your Thanksgiving meal and they go, that'll be $70. You go, we're doing, we're doing a bunch of frozen dinners and some rolls. Or if you go, that pill is $37,000. What are we eating for Thanksgiving? What is sin if the payment was Jesus' blood? Grace can only be amazing if you know how desperately you need it. Grace can only captivate you if you know how much you need it. Uh, there's a preacher named Ray Comfort uh, who gave an illustration, and I heard it in the mid-90s, and it changed everything about how I view the Bible and Christianity. He gives the example of getting on a plane, and as you get on the plane, you're handed a parachute. Uh, and you have to wear it the whole time. In your seat, it's already not that big and not comfortable. And it, at some point, you're gonna take the parachute off and go, it just, I don't need this. I don't need it at all. This was, made me uncomfortable. It made my life more difficult. It was burdensome. It gave me no benefit. But if you're getting on that plane and someone hands you a parachute and says, one hour and 32 minutes into this flight, there'll be an explosion and the plane's gonna go down then that parachute to you is your very life. It is more precious to you than your laptop, than your bag. It's more precious to you than anything, right? The gospel can't be precious to you until you realize how much you need Jesus' forgiveness that he gives for free. For free. Come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden. Is that first apply now? The Sermon on the Mount makes you weary and heavy laden. Come to me and you will find rest for your souls. <sighs> That's the gospel. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amen? Let's pray it together. And let's remember our humility. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen, Jesus.